Okay, it looks like it's top of the hour. Thank you everyone for joining us today for our first clinical webinar of 2023. Just a couple quick things before we get started. Certificates will be available on Monday by logging into your account and you can submit any questions throughout the webinar using the questions panel and we'll try to get to those at the end. Stacy, if you're ready to get started, go right ahead. All right, thank you so much for having me. I am honored to be here with you guys getting to present on a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. So just a little bit about myself before we kick this off. Um, I am Stacey Gallman. I have been a registered nurse for 12 years. Um, I have been a lactation professional since 2016. And I have dedicated much of my professional career to maternal and infant health, um, specifically the last several years and lactation specifically. So today we're going to talk about prenatal colostrum expression and collection, a creative and empowering approach to enhance breastfeeding outcomes. So our learning objectives, as you probably saw when you registered, but quickly we'll go through them, is to identify mother baby dyads who could benefit from prenatal colostrum expression and collection, to discuss the research as it relates to the safety, the efficacy, and the outcomes of prenatal colostrum expression and collection, to describe the impact prenatal colostrum expression and collection can have on exclusive breastfeeding rates, and to understand how to implement prenatal colostrum expression and collection safely into your practice as a professional. So this is the presentation overview. I'm not gonna read it to you guys, but you can have a quick snapshot of that. And let's dive right in. So I thought it was really important to kind of paint a picture of where we're at and where we desire to be so that we can really full circle see how that this intervention could be of benefit to mothers, babies, infant feeding, specifically related to breastfeeding outcomes. So I tried to gather information from a global perspective because I know that some of you are joining us from different countries, from different um, yes, from different countries, and so we have both the global perspective as well as I am in the United States of America, and so some more targeted numbers specifically for the US. So we'll see here that the world average, and this is from UNICEF and the World Health Organization, determines that 90% of mothers initiate breastfeeding, yet less than 40% are exclusively breastfeeding at six months, which is the recommendation. Um, and so, as we move ahead and we look specifically painting into the United States breastfeeding rates where I am located, we see that around 83% of mothers initiate breastfeeding, yet only 25% are exclusively breastfeeding at six months. We also see confirmed by the CDC breastfeeding report card that was just released last year in 2022, that 19.2% of breastfed infants receive supplementary formula before two days of life. So where we are continued. So first and foremost, before I start talking about um, breast milk substitutes, specifically formula, I want to just say and demystify the misconception that sometimes happens with lactation professionals that I do not think formula is a bad thing. I think that formula is a life-saving measure for babies when breast milk is not readily available, but breast milk should be the first choice if available. So with this being said, um, we'll see here on the screen that the World Health Organization and UNICEF released an article um, or a publication that is called How the Marketing of Formula Milk Influences Our Decisions on Infant Feeding. It also talks about it being a $55 billion industry 
and it talks about how this kind of um, interferes with outcomes to a specific maternal uh, direct consumer standpoint. It talks about how it affects us as healthcare providers and professionals in the way that we deliver our messaging, our education, and our stance on infant feeding. Um, and it talks about from like a systemic um, organizational viewpoint of how barriers can creep in in terms of this. You'll um, see here two little snapshots that I pulled directly from this that says, the evidence is strong. Formula milk marketing, not the product itself, disrupts informed decision making and undermines breastfeeding and child health. Below that, you'll see formula milk marketing still represents one of the most underappreciated risks to infant and young children's health. To the right hand side of the screen, you'll see a um, chart here that is showing the infant formula market based on industry size from 2021 and we'll see here where we're currently at about 55 billion dollar um, to where it's projected to be at 125 billion by 2030. The reason that I show you and the reason that this matters is we have to see what this is causing for breastfeeding rates and we have to see the projections and we have to figure out how can we um, first acknowledge that this is a problem and secondly, figure out creative approaches to protecting exclusive breastfeeding so that breast milk alternatives is not necessary all the time. So also what we know, and this is a research article and you can certainly um, get the resources or the references and look this up on your own time for the full um, article, but this talks about in hospital formula use increases early breastfeeding cessation among first time mothers intending to exclusively breastfeed. So you'll see here in the conclusions that it shows that when hospital formula supplementation was initiated that it was associated with nearly a two-fold greater risk of not fully breastfeeding um, within 30 to 60 days and nearly a three-fold risk of breastfeeding cessation by 60 days of life for the infant. And so we've got to figure out, as it says here, strategies to be sought out to avoid unnecessary in-hospital formula supplementation and to support breastfeeding when in hospital formula supplementation is unavoidable because we know that sometimes it is unavoidable and it is medically indicated, um, but more times than not, we could have a stance of protection of mother's own breast milk. So quickly on this, this is just um, a stance of wanting to encourage us to acknowledge that colostrum is an effective way um, to stabilize blood glucose in infants. So this was an article that was done that talked specifically about prenatal colostrum that was used for supplementation um, in babies. And this was kind of a process change that happened in labor and delivery in the hospital setting and ended with great outcomes. And so I would encourage you to check out this article. Um, but ultimately what this proved to us was that colostrum is an effective way to stabilize blood glucose levels in infants. We know that sometimes it takes a little bit longer to peak to the desired state for the blood glucose, but once it gets there, it typically will maintain the level um, much better than when formula is used for supplementation for blood glucose stabilization. It's a quick spike, but oftentimes we see that we have multiple issues, kind of like a roller coaster with the blood sugar not staying stable. So continued, um, I don't think anyone on the call as healthcare professionals would argue that we know this to be true, that the benefits of colostrum are absolutely astronomical. We know that colostrum is the ideal nutrition that is specifically tailored for newborns. Um, we know that colostrum is very different in composition than mature milk 
and it contains twice as much protein as mature milk and of course different factors as well. Um, but we'll see here on this page that we also, I would encourage you to think about that donor milk is typically mature milk in composition. So oftentimes when mothers have a surplus of um, human milk or they have various, you know, experiences that they find themselves donating their human milk to a milk bank for pasteurization, then that's typically once mature milk has um, began. And so we have to acknowledge the difference in colostrum versus donor milk, which is, hum which is typically mature milk. Um, we also know that colostrum is like medicine for our vulnerable preterm babies. And so um, it is very, very amazing for all babies, but specifically our more vulnerable babies. Um, so where do we desire to be? So I did a little timeline here of the current where um, we desire to be in the next couple years and then um, latter part of 2030. And so as you'll see here, we have to figure out ways that we can implement strategies and interventions to effectively enhance breastfeeding rates based on today's reality. So as you'll see here, some of the ways that I have projected based on my own literature review and research um, and professional experience is to place an emphasis on prenatal preparation and education that leads to empowerment and self-efficacy for mothers and also active participation in their own journey. Um, secondly, intentional work as healthcare providers to decrease the percentage of unnecessary formula supplementations for infants that the mother desires to be breastfed. Because as we have seen, um, when supplementation of alternative breast milk substitutes happen, it has, an, it has an effect to cripple or negatively impact breastfeeding outcomes. So we wanna do our due diligence of trying to protect that if at all possible. Um, and then next, helping communities develop and implement breastfeeding programs or interventions that meet the needs of populations disproportionately impacted by structural barriers that can lead to lower rates of breastfeeding. So I think we have to acknowledge this to be true. So the goal, and I got this specifically from the World Health Organization and UNICEF is by 2025, to increase to at least 50% the rate of exclusive breastfeeding in the first six months. So as we saw previously, we're at about 40% um, globally currently, and we desire to be um, about 10% increase in two years. And then as we move further along the timeline by 2030, uh, the desired global prevalence of breastfeeding in 2030 targets, and this is in alignment with uh, Healthy People 2030, is that the percentage of babies um, under six months who are exclusively breastfed to increase to 70%. So from 2025 to 2030 in five years, the goal is to increase that by nearly right at 20% increase. So I think that we have to do our part to acknowledge that um, perhaps we have to uh, address or become more aware of what we're currently doing and perhaps tweak it a bit, do it better, or even get a creative approach in doing something, adopting some new ways to really move the needle to hopefully help us meet those goals, but more importantly, to help mothers and infants and health outcomes. Um, so this slide here is specifically just to kind of say kudos um, that the American Academy of Pediatrics this past year in 2022 released their policy statement and aligned with the World Health Organization and UNICEF on breastfeeding recommendations of exclusive breast milk feeding for the first six months of life with the addition of complementary foods and continuation of breastfeeding until the mother and baby desire for two years and beyond. So I think it's just really um, exciting 
that as large credentialing organizations who, who have the most influence in this space, and as they should, um, we are getting on level playing fields so we can minim minimize kind of the inconsistent messaging that can cause some confusion and distrust lack of clarity for the mothers and as for us as healthcare providers um, now that we're all really aligned. So why it matters. So 60% of mothers report that they stopped breastfeeding earlier than they desired. You can see that validated here in this article reasons for earlier than desired cessation of breastfeeding. Um, so would encourage you to check that out. And then next is just the effects on health outcomes and that this is a public health concern. You'll see here from the World Health Organization and UNICEF, I grabbed this from an infographic and it talks about that suboptimal breastfeeding contributes to more than 800,000 infant deaths and countries lose more than $300 billion annually because of low breastfeeding rates. And so this, this is why it matters. And then from an infant standpoint, it matters because we know that babies who are fed nothing but breast milk from birth through their first six months of life get the absolute best start. We know that exclusive breastfeeding provides the perfect nutrition um, for babies' healthy growth and their brain development. We know the protection, the benefits from respiratory infections, different disease processes, and other life-threatening elements. And of course, um, here in the United States, a very high income um, with great resources, there is still many, many benefits um, that breastfeeding contributes to infant health and even beyond. And then protection against obesity and non-communicable diseases such as asthma and diabetes and so forth. And so, um, like I said, this is from the World Health Organization and UNICEF. So co some considerations and reflections for us as healthcare providers. And before I kind of get started on this, I want to first say this is in no way, shape or form to point fingers or anything of that nature. This is simply a way for us to take ownership that our voice matters more than we know. Um, and for us to just take an internal look at where are we and are there some areas that maybe we need to be more aware of, maybe we need to increase our confidence or our knowledge um, to truly work towards moving the needle to increase outcomes as it relates to breastfeeding and maternal and infant health. So knowing that our perception, our biases, um, and our advocation on breastfeeding or lack thereof as the healthcare professionals impact breastfeeding and health outcomes. And also acknowledging that there is inconsistent messaging that happens where one person may not find it as of importance, one person may find it of as, as important, and the way that those personal experiences can um, reflect in some biases and then inconsistent messaging can, as I mentioned earlier, it can cause some confusion for the patient and also unrealistic expectations, knowing what's normal um, for baby size, for the amount that they need in the first days, um, understanding the pathology and the physiology of lactogenesis and being able to share that with our patients in a very confident manner so that they understand what is normal um, will be so helpful. And so you'll see here in this article, health professionals attitudes and beliefs about breastfeeding. And ultimately it just proves exactly what I just mentioned that our voice matters more than sometimes we realize. So questions to ask ourselves. And of course, this is based on a personal uh, professional delivery basis on a system wide organizational and even as a nation and a global um, perspective. So do we feel, do you feel that mothers are receiving adequate and consistent education to make informed decisions regarding infant feeding in the prenatal setting? Are mothers who are at risk for impaired breastfeeding outcomes 
being assessed, counseled, and made aware by a prenatal professional before birth. If a mother introduces infant formula for supplementation needs during hospitalization, yet intended to breastfeed exclusively, is there a follow-up process for continuation of care and weaning of infant formula? Is breastfeeding medicine and care currently more proactive or reactive in nature? And which do you feel would yield better outcomes and results? So these are just some questions to kind of get us thinking of what does our current reality look like knowing where our goals and where we desire to be because I think we have to acknowledge what current state looks like in order to work towards improving and meeting our goals and helping to improve outcomes. So how can we help? Of course, this list is very minor in a practical sense, but I tried to do my due diligence of, um, from all the research I've done to kind of combining to four things. So first, recognize the impact that prenatal preparation has on breastfeeding. And if you don't have a process that allows you to um, you know, assess these moms, identify these moms that might be at risk for breastfeeding difficulties and refer them to a prenatal lactation professional for consultation, then figure out how you could implement that process because that will be very impactful. Secondly, help communities develop and implement breastfeeding programs that meet the needs and it can, um, help overcome structural barriers. And so we kind of already talked about that in a previous slide, but that's really, really important. Um, aligning our stance as healthcare professionals to limit the marketing of breast milk substitutes and its usage if it is not indeed medically necessary. We know that sometimes it is, but we need to take ownership of taking that extra step of protection um, of helping the mom to provide her own breast milk if her goal is to exclusively breastfeed if it's not medically indicated. And then lastly on here, recognizing the importance that self-efficacy, realistic expectations and adequate support have on breastfeeding outcomes. And as I mentioned previously, refer to prenatal lactation providers. The goal is that there is a, um, a, a triad where it's the healthcare provider, the lactation professional, and then the family that is working on a plan prenatally with education and preparation um, so that they step into their journey well equipped and educated to meet their goals and to provide the best nutrition for their babies. So this is just an article that um, kind of confirms the um, updates on first week of exclusive breastfeeding among infants greater than 35 weeks. And so ultimately this is just sharing with us that um, our support as healthcare providers, making sure that we have effective processes in place, that we are limiting structural barriers as much as possible um, are super impactful for helping to move the needle in a positive way. And then understanding that if um, we don't have those things in place that we need to do our part to start thinking about the implementation of that. So this slide is about awareness and reflection. And so this is an article by Diane Spatz, who is just an absolute hero in the breastfeeding space. And um, I've looked up to a lot as a, as a distant mentor, but she released this article that says changing the prenatal care um, paradigm to improve breastfeeding outcomes. And I think if we're really, really honest with ourselves as professionals, as system levels, as organizational levels, as national levels, and as a global level, that this is what truly has to happen in order for us to expect postpartum outcomes to be more positive and to improve those breastfeeding outcomes. And so I love to ask this question. Um, I ask it a lot in my everyday professional world um, and various other things. So it might feel a little silly, but go with it. So if I can wave a magic wand 
and an intervention appeared that involved adopting a practice that was linked to empowerment of the mother, self-efficacy, shared decision-making, active participation, decreased formula supplementation, and higher exclusive breastfeeding rates, would I listen? Would I be interested? Would I be open-minded about it? And would I share it? So just some reflection. So let's talk about what we're here today to really unpack. So prenatal colostrum expression and collection. I've also put on this slide a couple other titles that you may see it called interchangeably. So antenatal breast milk expression, you may hear antenatal colostrum expression, colostrum harvesting. Um, my goal is that one day we do kind of get to uh, a one phrase so that it doesn't cause confusion, but currently based on different countries, um, there is some different titles, but ultimately the process and the definition is the same. So this is a process involving prenatal expressing and storing of colostrum. So you'll see here that this is pulled directly from a research article that included many different references here of various articles. And it says it benefit, its benefits include quicker establishment of full lactation, increased confidence in hand expressing, and reduced stress over breast milk supply in the immediate postpartum period. And what we know to be true is that oftentimes why women stop breastfeeding is due to breastfeeding difficulties, due to a perceived low milk supply, or there is issues with supplementation that ends up needing artificial breast milk substitutes involved due to a delay in lactogenesis to occurring. Um, so that full lactation. And so with that being said, this is telling us that this can be an intervention prenatally when done safely and correctly that can mitigate this. And so you'll see here, I pulled a quote um, from a research article that Diane Spatz and Nina Junoril um, did a couple years ago. And it says an intervention that is becoming more prevalent and has the potential to mitigate current suboptimal breastfeeding outcomes and premature cessation of breastfeeding. So I think we have to do our part as healthcare providers to figure out what actually is this, to become more aware and educated about it, acknowledge that mothers are doing it, and that we have the um, opportunity to figure out a structured way that we can disseminate this for safety and efficacy and to also improve outcomes. And so that's why I'm super passionate about this. You'll see lots of different research articles um, here on the screen that have flashed up, many that have been utilized in this presentation today. Um, but as you'll see there, more research is desired. Yet, I would say that the safety, the efficacy, and the outcomes have been confirmed by the current research that is out there. Um, research continues due to the prevalence of the topic. It is what we would like to call a hot topic. Um, many, many people have questions about this and many moms are beginning to utilize this intervention. So another article that you'll see here is the effect of antenatal expression of breast milk at term in reducing breastfeeding failures. And so you can certainly go and look this up on your own time, but the conclusion here shows us that daily antenatal or prenatal breast milk expression after 37 completed weeks of pregnancy significantly reduced the time of establishing full breastfeeding and reduced breastfeeding failures. And so talking again about that, um, de that delay in lactogenesis too and how we know that there's a lot of um, barriers that can creep in to uh, result in the cessation of breastfeeding. And so this as an intervention to significantly reduce the time in establishing that full breastfeeding um, and to reduce breastfeeding failures, of course, that would make sense. 
So the, more, the most voice concerned by healthcare providers that I hear, and I'm sure you've heard, is will it cause preterm labor? Because of course, that is something that we certainly do not want to happen. And so I have pulled this comparison chart here from an article that we previously referenced by Diane Spatz and Nina Junorell. Um, and it, I'm not going to read this in, thing to it, in its entirety to you, but I would encourage you to take time to go and look at the article and really unpack this comparison of nipple stimulation for um, labor induction or augmentation versus antenatal or prenatal breast milk expression. And so ultimately, um, the difference is, is in the way that the um, hormones is primed. And then also, uh, let's just acknowledge that yes, both of these will release oxytocin, um, but you'll see here that research has confirmed that um, it has been proposed that antenatal colostrum expression may result in a release of oxytocin lead into premature labor. However, sex also results in oxytocin release and sex is generally considered safe and low risk pregnancies. In example, no risk for preterm labor or antepartum hemorrhage. And so as you'll see here, the biggest part of this is that the introduction of antenatal colostrum expressing education into routine antenatal care did not result in higher rates to the special care nursery or lower gestational age at birth. And so that concern has been dispelled. So this is the DAME trial, which is the best research that we currently have to date. It was an unblinded multi-center randomized control trial. And so three things that I pulled from there to share with you guys is that it says our trial aimed to address concerns that antenatal breast stimulation might lead to oxytocin release and earlier onset of labor. Our findings have reviewed this concern. So again, and then their proportion of infants admitted to the NICU did not differ between the antenatal expressing versus the standard care. And you'll see there it was 15% to 14%. So that's really promising. And then there is no harm in advising women with diabetes in pregnancy at low risk of complications to express breast milk from 36 weeks gestation. So I would like to mention that you will see 36 weeks and 37 weeks kind of used interchangeably in the research. And much of that is, um, I perceive, related to it being different countries. And so in the UK, Australia, oftentimes you'll see 36 weeks as the standard. Um, here in the United States, you'll typically see 37 weeks as the standard um, for beginning this for low-risk pregnancies. And the mindset of that is the at 37 weeks, you technically have reached a term pregnancy. And so the chance of preterm labor scares is completely out of question. So let's talk about breastfeeding self-efficacy really quickly. So this is the motivation to breastfeed when the next expectation of success in meeting breastfeeding goals and the determination to persevere in overcoming breastfeeding challenges. Um, so as you might see and know that when a mother has increased confidence and determination, um, she usually will succeed. And so anything that we can do prenatally to increase breastfeeding self-efficacy, we know is going to help us move the needle in terms of increasing breastfeeding rates and outcomes. These are a couple um, articles here of research that you may find interesting that really relate to, uh, relate to breastfeeding self-efficacy. So you might ask, so who could benefit from this? So these are some dyads who may benefit. So mothers who are at risk for breastfeeding difficulties. So think about mothers who have implications for delayed lactogenesis too, or a low breast milk production. So maybe a mom has had a baby before and she struggled with low milk supply. This could be a great um, 
pregnancy, or this could be a great dyad that she may benefit from this intervention. If a mom has breast hypoplasia or insufficient glandular tissue, a history of breast surgery, which of course um, alters the volume or capacity in the breast, um, so either a reduction or an augmentation. Um, mothers who are obese, um, mothers who have maternal endocrine disorders, such as polycystic ovarian syndrome, hypothyroidism, pituitary disorders, a history of infertility, um, mothers who have a C-section, um, and then also mothers that find themselves um, dealing with maternal and infant separation. Um, newborns who are at risk for supplementation needs are definitely, um, our newborns could benefit from a mom doing the intervention of prenatal colostrum expression and collection if they qualify for this. So babies who are at risk for hypoglycemia, maybe their mom has diabetes in pregnancy. Um, if the baby is projected to be small or large for gestational age, um, or if a baby is born late preterm, we know that those babies can have a harder time transitioning sometimes with temperature regulation, um, oftentimes with just energy reserve for feeding and for other things as well. And so they also are at risk for low blood sugar issues because of that. Um, babies that are at risk for issues with effective latching at the breast. So maybe the baby is projected to have a cleft lip, uh, lip and or palate. We know that that is a red flag and um, re it requires a lot of individualized um, effort and care. And so this could be a way um, that the mother could have a uh, the colostrum on hand to feed that baby via, via syringe, finger feeding, um, spoon or cup, so alternative feeding methods, and then babies that have tethered oral tissue, such as different ties that can affect um, effective latching at the breast. So the potential impact on exclusive breastfeeding, so I'm not going to read all of these to you, um, but what I will tell you is that it says here in the suggested clinical implications from the research article listed to the left here, mother's experiences with antenatal milk expression, is that this has the potential to be a proactive, we talked about reactive versus proactive earlier, a proactive intervention that begins in the antepartum period after 36 weeks gestation or 37, sometimes you know we've seen that interchangeably, to support breastfeeding outcomes during postpartum. And it does say that more evidence is needed on the outcomes. And like I said, thankfully, there is more research being done. Um, it can also, uh, antenatal milk expression may play an important role in lactation care for families who want to prevent formula supplementation for anticipated neonatal complications, such as infant hypoglycemia, um, and then families that have a strong intention to provide human milk to their infants and want to learn how best to reach their personal breastfeeding goals, this can have positive impact and overall can positively impact exclusive breastfeeding. So I am really thankful to be able to share um, this specific pilot project that the Mayo Clinic Hospital System, the Red Wing specifically, did that relates um, to antenatal colostrum expression. So in 2014, prior to this project, their exclusivity of breastfeeding at discharge was 63%. And at that time, 46% of babies received formula in the first four hours, yet the mother's nutritional plan for the baby was breast milk. After implementation of this antenatal colostrum expression project in 2016, their exclusivity at hospital discharge had increased to 76% and less than 30% of babies received formula in the first four hours in the antenatal colostrum expression group after implementation. And so you'll see the charts down below but I think that this shows us how proven um, and promising this is. You'll also see that they did a 2016 interim review 
And this showed that their exclusivity rate for sustainability at two months postpartum had increased from 21% to 55%. That is awesome. You'll also see that mothers reported greater confidence in breastfeeding. And then thank goodness that there was no adverse maternal or infant outcomes with the um, implementation of adopting this practice for low risk pregnancies. And then in 2018, they reported that their exclusivity at discharge had increased to 81%. This is amazing and so promising. So let's talk about implementation of what this could look like for you on a professional basis, um, whether you are private with a large healthcare organization and so forth. So first, I think we have to assess the need for a standardized approach and to regulate the safety and structure um, for the implementation of this practice change assess the need for a system-wide education um, on this topic to the healthcare professionals that take care of moms and babies. And then from a practical standpoint, uh, to begin identifying and assessing mother baby dyads at around 28 weeks when they get into that third trimester, who may benefit from this type of intervention and refer them to a prenatal lactation professional. Secondly, identifying. So we just talked about identifying the mother baby dyads who could benefit, but then identifying a process for prenatal um, consultation referrals for qualifying mothers to receive consistent education and walk through a framework that really helps to disseminate this process. And then identify key stakeholders who will be impactful in this process change. When you're changing a process specifically on a system-wide level, it can be really intimidating and overwhelming. So you have to have some key stakeholders who are willing to help you um, move the needle and change the culture. Next, third, planning. So ensuring that you have appropriate documents um, created. So maybe a policy or a guideline for both the prenatal clinic area as well as the inpatient hospital are figuring out a process to refer to third party um, systems or lactation professionals that are well equipped and knowledgeable about this type of implementation process. Try to um, have consistent messaging and education that is disseminated to your patients, perhaps maybe a video that they watch, handouts, uh, expressing tracking log and et cetera. You will find in the handout section of this that I have some handouts that I have just created on my own personal basis um, that you may find helpful. And so if so, please feel free to utilize those. And then deciding tools that's preferred for your patients to use as expression and collection and for feeding to their newborns. And then next, executing this. So supporting the process change um, that could help to enhance breastfeeding and newborn outcomes. And then considering perhaps doing a pilot project like I just showed that the Mayo Clinic Hospital did to track the data within your own hospital clinic, um, et cetera, to compare patients who engage in this intervention versus a control group. So this just shows you a example of a guideline prenatal hand expression of breast milk. Um, that may be useful and helpful for healthcare systems or clinics. Um, again, this is something that I have as well as a step-by-step -step guide to safely hand expressing colostrum. Um, and so this is kind of just a, a more of a, a patient instruction. Um, but you'll see here that typically it is um, proven to be safe to do hand expressing um, for low risk pregnancies for about five minutes per breast and twice a, twice a day starting at 37 weeks and beyond. Um, and so I want to end this by bringing it very personal. So I think sometimes we can have all the knowledge in the world, but whenever we hear how this is truly impacting on a personal experience, it can really come full circle. 
So I want to introduce you to Mercedes. Mercedes is a G2. She delivered her first baby girl at 39 weeks and three days for a scheduled C-section due to gestational diabetes. She delivered her second baby, her son, at 40 weeks and two days. You'll see there she has a history of gestational diabetes um, and microsomnia. And this is what she said about her journey. Colostrum expression prenatally had such a positive impact on my breastfeeding journey. Even more with my second child after I had learned more about the process. I am so thankful I had prenatal express colostrum on hand because it gave me such confidence when issues with latching occurred right away with my first. With my second pregnancy, I began hand expression right at 37 weeks and did so consistently until I delivered full term and I was thankfully able to accumulate quite a stash of frozen colostrum. I felt that doing prenatal hand expression made my milk come in much sooner which was amazing and decreased stress in the early days. My second child had to spend time in the NICU due to a concern that I had developed choreo and having the stored colostrum readily available for the nurses to give him if needed made such a positive difference on how I felt as a NICU mom. Prenatal colostrum expression made such a big difference for me and my babies in some of the most important days of my life. I am thankful my babies only received my milk for any supplementation. Let me introduce you to Portia. Portia is a G2P1. She found herself having a C-section at 40 weeks and four days. Overall, Portia went into labor and birth with really no risk factors for ineffective breastfeeding, or needing to really have collected colostrum on hand. This is what she said. I decided to start hand expressing to collect colostrum at 37 weeks in case my son had any initial struggles with latching. It was a huge confidence booster to see that I actually had colostrum and that my body was doing what it was intended to do. And it was nice to learn hand expression prior to birth. After a couple of feeds, my son had a low blood sugar. So we started to give some of the express colostrum that I had collected. It was such a huge relief to be able to have that ready for him and not have to rely on formula for his supplementation in the first few days of life. I am a firm believer that colostrum collection is so vital prenatally. Whether you have risk factors for breastfeeding struggles or not, because you never know what could happen. We have been successfully breastfeeding for seven months now. We added solids at six months and I have been back to work since three months. So exciting. And then lastly, I wanna introduce you to my story. So this is me. I had a history of infertility. I have polycystic ovarian syndrome. And once I became pregnant, I had gestational diabetes in both of my pregnancies. I delivered my first son at 39 weeks and three days via an induction. And I had my second son at 38 weeks and two days. Both of my boys were born with class four lip and tongue ties that had to have intervention done. And this is ultimately why this is so important to me. So this is some things from my journey that I would share. I knew that on paper, as a lactation consultant, I was a recipe for a breastfeeding disaster. So I wanted to do everything in my power to prepare for the worst and making the decision to collect and store colostrum prenatally, to have on hand, knowing that my babies were at risk for supplementation was one of the most empowering decisions that I could have ever made. And I stand in that very firm. My son's blood sugar did drop and I did need to supplement him with my prenatally collected colostrum after latching. I was so thankful I had a backup plan that allowed me to pivot and maintain a sense of control. I felt that knowing I had the collected colostrum decreased the pressure of things going perfect in the first days because I knew I had my milk if needed. Therefore, this, just, this decreased my stress drastically. 
My husband, who you'll see there in the picture to the right, syringe and finger feeding our second son, some of my prenatally collected colostrum, um, he was able to actively participate in our feeding journey also. And this was a very special form of bonding for our family. And lastly, I was able to exclusively breastfeed both of my boys without any artificial breast milk substitutes for six months and then continued beyond 12 months after adding in complementary foods. Prenatal colostrum collection was a pivotal decision in both of our journeys. And so this is why I stand so passionate on this topic to move the needle in terms of breastfeeding outcomes, because I know that if I had all of the risk factors for ineffective breastfeeding and had a low risk pregnancy and chose to do this, and it greatly impacted my journey and outcomes, that I want other moms and babies to have that same opportunity. And I want us as healthcare professionals to figure out how we can support that best. So thanks for your time. I am happy to entertain any questions if we have any time. You will see my contact information here. If there's anything that I can help you to do to implement this um, or to talk further, it would be such an honor. So I'll pass this back to you guys. Perfect, Stacy. that was amazing. Thank you so much. The first question I'll read I am all about colostrum rather than formula for supplementing newborns. Why should we encourage prenatal expression of colostrum when we can get it in those early hours of postpartum? Yeah, so that's a great question. I will 100% say that fresh colostrum is always best case. And so if you are able to get it in those first hours, then absolutely feed that as priority. But what I will also say in my professional experience is that sometimes due to um, the laboring process, the birth process, that is not always a possibility. And sometimes mothers, despite great effort um, with professional help, uh, will struggle based on different you know, circumstances that could have happened in pregnancy or in birth to get adequate drops in those first hours. Thank you so much. Was the volume of colostrum needed to treat hypoglycemia similar to the volume of formula needed? Yeah, so I'll be really honest with you. I would have to go back and look at the volume amounts in that article because I don't want to answer unknowingly specifically um, the, the actual numbers. Um, but that's definitely something I'll look into and would encourage you to do the same. Perfect, thank you. Do you know if milk banks take colostrum if a mother is willing to hand express prenatally? Yeah, so that is a great question. I actually don't know the answer to that, but I do think that that is something uh, future speaking that should be conversations that will need to be had. Um, because the reality is, is sometimes moms will prenatally collect and express colostrum and thankfully some moms will never need it. And so in the event of that, those could be perfect opportunities that there could be a collaboration of that sort. Perfect. At our hospital, we take the mom's colostrum from home and thaw it in the Medela milk warmer. Then we feed the milk to the infant over the course of as long as 24 hours following milk storage guidelines. However, I saw in your handout that we should be using the thawed milk within two hours. Are you able to explain this difference? Yeah, so first of all, amazing. That sounds like you guys are really moving the needle in that. And so that's really encouraging to me. So good work in that respect. Um, so I just specifically took that from uh, milk storage guidelines. And so, yeah, that, that's specifically where that time frame come from. But uh, perhaps based off of the process that you have at your facility, or based off of the equipment that you use that perhaps may could change the way that the, the time limit is, but I specifically took that amount just from the breast milk storage guidelines. Okay, thank you. 
What is meant by breastfeeding medicine in slide number 16? Yeah, so ultimately I think that relates to lactation care in its entirety. So the education that is delivered prenatally, um, our confidence as healthcare providers in the way that we disseminate and deliver that, um, and then ultimately just the impact that we know that breastfeeding um, can have on infant outcomes as well as maternal outcomes. And so I think just the entire um, kind of lactation spectrum, it could ultimately be, that's what I encompass as breastfeeding medicine. Okay. When researching, did you discover how many parents have cholecystitis intended or desired to exclusively breastfeed and have been discouraged to antenatally express colostrum? That is actually a first. I have, I have no knowledge in terms of being able to answer that question, but that definitely creates some curiosity for me. <laughs> <laughs> me as well. Um, what about having an at-risk mother express an early labor? Is that being done? An at-risk mother, so I, I, I would want to know, are you mean an at-risk for breastfeeding difficulties or like an at-risk pregnancy? Because I think that really determines the way I would answer this question. Um, if it's at-risk for breastfeeding difficulties, then I would say that that would definitely be impactful um, if the mom was willing to do that and there was a professional to, to follow through with that process. Um, I'm not sure if that's being done, you know, standard or not, I'll say that I, that's not something that's being done with what I am familiar with. Um, in terms of at-risk pregnancy, then I would say that that's going to be a question that would need to be fielded to the healthcare provider, but typically um, I, I would imagine that the answer to that would be no, but that would be something that would need to be addressed with the healthcare provider. Okay. Um, anten antenatal milk, forgive me for mispronouncing, antenatal milk expression may lead to greater colostrum availability for infant use postnatally, slide number 27. Is this theory or fact? So there are some research studies being done currently that is really looking into the volumes and um, lots of things in greater detail in terms of prenatal versus postnatal colostrum. Um, and so I would say that probably in today, right now, current state, that it's more of theory with uh, validation from consistent experiences. But I think that I would tell you that there is research being done so that that can be very factual. Um, there is some research out there, though, that will confirm that when hand expression is done within an hour after birth, it will show you the greater volume of colostrum versus not implementing that one hour after birth. And so that could be something for you to look into. Okay. Um... Could we get a definition of antenatal milk expression? Does this only include hand expression or does this include those who express using a pump? Yeah, so I do think that there is a lack of clarity in that sense. And so that's a great question. Um, personally, I just encourage mothers to do hand expression prenatally. Um, however, what I will tell you is postnatally, if there is issues with breastfeeding struggles, then there is the need to also have conversations about implementing pumping um, at that point. But I do not typically recommend the use of a pump prenatally, just because from the research that I have done, it shows that the priming um, could be more like nipple stimulation when using a pump versus using your hands because of the difference of the prolactin response, because with a pump, there is actually suction and with using your hands, there is no suction. 
Okay, thank you, Stacy, for presenting for us today. That was very valuable information. And thank you, Wendy, for going through the questions and answers for me. I really appreciate it. Just a couple quick things before we end. Um, certificates, again, will be available on Monday by logging into your accounts. And the registration for the February 15th webinar is open. You can visit medilaeducation.com to learn more and register. And if you'd like a copy of our Leading Lactation Insights monthly newsletter, you can email education at medila.com for that. I hope everyone has a great afternoon. Thank you.